Hey listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode is a follow-up to episode four with Howie Lempel about pandemic preparedness. If you know nothing at all about health security, then you might want to go back and listen to that one first because it goes into the issue a bit more slowly. With this episode, it was great to finally get time with someone who has over a decade of experience at senior levels of government. A bunch of you have gotten in touch to say that the reason you're not yet pursuing a career in biosecurity or pandemic preparedness is that you don't know exactly what to study or where you should first apply to work. For that reason, uh, we tackle those questions in the last half an hour of the show. I've also compiled a list of dozens of schools, organizations, and PhD supervisors in the blog post about this episode. And many of those actually aren't discussed by Beth here. They've been recommended by other people. So if that's what's been holding you back, please go out and check that full list and see if any of them are suitable next steps for you. If you can imagine going to grad school in biology or medicine or public administration to tackle pandemics, or you're already in a position to apply to one of the organizations we mentioned on the show here, you should definitely apply to us for free one-on-one coaching to help you take action. We can potentially put you in touch with mentors and give you advice on your application and uh, help you choose between your various different options. The link to apply for coaching is in the show notes uh, and the associated blog post. And now I bring you Beth Cameron. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Elizabeth Cameron. Beth is the Nuclear Threat Initiative's Senior Director for Global Biological Policy and Programs. She previously served as the Senior Director for Global Health Security and Biodefense on the White House National Security Council staff, where she was instrumental in developing and launching the Global Health Security Agenda, which tackles problems in biosecurity, emerging infectious diseases, dual-use research, and bioterrorism. From 2010 to 2013, she served as Office Director for the Cooperative Threat Reduction and Senior Advisor uh, for the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs. She also served on the White House Ebola Task Force, which I think we'll end up talking about. She also holds a PhD in Biology from John Hopkins University and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So thanks so much for coming on the show. It's an impressive CV there. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be here today. I think this is a really important topic for us to be discussing. Great. So I recently interviewed Howie Lempel from the Open Philanthropy Project for about uh, two and a half hours about his views on, on pandemic preparedness. So there's, there's a lot of material out there. If, if, you, uh, if you're listening to this episode and you haven't heard that one, uh, go back and listen to it. And today I was hoping to get into lots of specifics about uh, what's being done already about pandemic preparedness and bioterrorism uh, and how it can be improved from someone who's uh, obviously been really uh, close to the thick of the action. So first, uh, tell me a bit about what, you, what you're doing now at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. So thanks so much. Um, The Nuclear Threat Initiative uh, was founded in 2001 uh, by former Senator Sam Nunn and philanthropist Ted Turner, and they founded it in order to reduce risks posed by attacks with weapons of mass destruction and disruption. And so that includes nuclear threats, biological threats, radiological, chemical, and also cyber attacks. Um, And currently, Secretary Ernest Moniz, who was uh, most recently President Obama's energy secretary, is our CEO, um, and he joined just recently, which is really exciting. Um, NTI is a really unique kind of organization. I would describe us best as a do tank. So we typically catalyze activities. We um, we look at where we might be able to make an impact as a non-governmental organization on CBRN and cyber-related threats. And then we work together, often with governments and often with the non-governmental se- sector and civil society, to create new and creative ways of tackling a problem. Um, and so historically, that's what we've done. And specific to the biological threat, a few things that we've done in the past, prioritizing biosecurity and global health security, we've looked at, um, we have created um, a long time ago in 2002, we were one of the first organizations to work with the WHO to create an emergency outbreak response fund, which has now been folded into the larger contingency fund for Ebola. We were also a co-sponsor of the Fink Report, which was one of the seminal reports looking at um, experiments of concern in the biological area. And we prioritize regional biosurveillance, uh, working to help launch the Connecting Organizations for Regional Disease Surveillance Initiative, CORDS. I joined NTI in March of this year, and part of my job here um, now at NTI at this really important uh, time for looking at pandemic preparedness and global biological threats, um, my my job is really to help uh, look at the ways in which we can make the biggest impact now and to really address how the biological threat and landscape is changing. So it's a really good time to be having this podcast and to be having this discussion with you. So NTI has some pretty impressive people involved. I think I looked at your board and it's uh, a lot of of luminaries on there, right? Yes, absolutely. We have um, we have a number of luminaries. And of course, um, Senator Sam Nunn is still one of the co-chairs of NTI and really brings a tremendous amount of weight around the world and also still within the U.S. government towards tackling these threats. And uh, does that give you a lot of access to, to the government? So NTI has been historically uh, very active in providing models for the go- for governments, including the U.S. government, 
but also working with other governments for different ways in which to reduce WMD threats. Biodefense has been a major focus for the last um, two White Houses, for President Bush, for President Obama, and it's also becoming a focus of some of the activities under President Trump. So I think that this is really an area where we might be able to make some bipartisan progress. The current Homeland Security Advisor, Tom Bossert, recently said when he was out at, at Aspen at the Security Forum, he talked about biodefense, the importance of a new biodefense strategy, and also the importance of the global health security agenda. So these are promising areas where uh, there might be some, some good work that can be done over the next couple of years that really builds on the past um, two decades. So, so what kinds of things uh, is NTI trying to accomplish at the moment, or what kind of specific projects are you working on? So as I mentioned, um, I'm, I'm here to build um, some new activities in the biological threat space, but just to give a preview of some of the areas that we're working on, um, with really generous support from the Open Philanthropy Project and the Robertson Foundation, we've been working with two other organizations, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and also the Economist Intelligence Unit on a pilot project to develop a global health security index. And so this would really take a lot of the great work that's been done in the global health security agenda to develop metrics uh, for how countries are, are able to improve their progress, common metrics that could be used by all countries. And it will take together that work, but also some additional indicators looking at broader systems and health care in countries and also other risks that might be relevant to epidemic threats, things like political security, things like economic security, things like how countries are doing with global norms in general. And it will, it, the pilot project is intended to see whether we can create a framework that might work for all countries to be able to really tell where all countries are doing with respect to national capacity for global health, for health security. So we're really excited about that project. And then in addition to that, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about it, um, an area that I know we'll, we'll probably be talking about later on in the podcast, which is advances in technology with the premise that technology is absolutely essential to developing um, new uh, new areas of, of need, like medical countermeasures, which can actually help counter biological threats. Also increasingly important for food security, energy security. Um, but on the flip side, advances in technology also make it possible for mistakes to be made um, in, the, in the laboratory, and also um, increase the likelihood that terrorists could use uh, biology as a weapon. And so um, we are looking at ways in which we might be able to bring together the innovation community uh, with the security community around the world to look at this issue in a more holistic way and potentially um, look at the development of international standards and norms. So you mentioned that uh, this is something of a priority for the administration under, under President Trump. From, from, from the outside, it looks like uh, the government's a little bit in, in, in disarray at the moment. Like They've got a, a, lot, of, a lot of problems on their plate. Uh, uh, are you getting a lot of time? Like, are, are there people um, in, in the military or you know, in the security services who, are, who are, have a lot of time to, to pay attention to pandemic preparedness at the moment? So it's, it's a really good question, and I won't, I won't speak for the administration since I'm not in, in the government anymore, but I, I will say that this year, in, in early 2017, the, um, the Congress actually mandated that four departments and agencies develop a new biodefense strategy, and those departments are the Department of Defense, the Department of, of Health and Human Services, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Homeland Security. And so that activity is definitely garnering a lot of attention within departments and agencies and also at the White House. Um, so I'm really hopeful that there will be renewed activity looking at biodefense, and really importantly, biodefense that doesn't just focus on what we're doing domestically in the United States, but biodefense is a much larger concept that looks at how prepared countries are around the world. And so success to me with a biodefense strategy in 2017 would look like having, um, having a strategy that bolsters our own uh, capabilities here, but also provides a pathway towards continuing to lead on helping countries to get prepared around the world and ideally financing for both of those things. So is, is NTI a place you'd recommend that, that people work? Does it seem to have a, have a large impact? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, so NTI is a relatively small um, but extraordinarily impactful organization. We're less than 50 people, um, but over the, the lifespan, we've done some enormously impactful things. And I gave you a couple of examples um, earlier in the biological space where you know we were able to catalyze the first, what I believe is the first emergency outbreak response fund at the WHO. Um, but in the area of nuclear security, I'll, I'll give you an, another um, example Throughout President Obama's nuclear security summit um, area of, of focus over the, four, the eight years um, that he was president, uh, we we uh, launched and and um, and implemented an activity called the Global Dialogue, which brought together countries. Um, we, because we convened it as a non governmental organization, we were able to tackle some thorny issues that were more difficult to tackle um, from a governmental perspective, and that really resulted in the delivery of some specific new commitments. This is obviously a really sensitive and tough topic, but because we were able to do that, it resulted in increased awareness among countries about how they were doing in specific um, areas relative to that threat. Um, and we were we were actually cited 
by several government officials um, during the nuclear security summit process. And we know that countries are really paying attention to how they're doing in that document. So we've been able to make um, an impact um, in some really creative ways. So, so NTI kind of has, has a global influence. People, people look to NTI for, for ideas on what to do about nuclear security and other security issues in, in Europe as well. Yes, absolutely. We've worked with, um, we've worked through through the process I just mentioned as just one example. We worked with countries around the world and in the biological sphere in the areas that I'm looking at, um, we're certainly looking at how we can convene countries to improve biosecurity commitments. That's one area that's really been lacking um, in, in many of the, the multilateral uh, forum that deal with health. And we think that we have um, a comparative advantage in our ability to bring together um, a large number of countries, not only health ministries, but importantly, getting ministries of foreign affairs and ministries of defense to the table as well. So NTI hires fairly senior people. It, it looks to me. I think a lot of people listening will be in their in their twenties. Are, are there any roles for people who are who are younger? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a number of fellows and interns um, here that that go off to different careers. Um, we um, currently, I, I have um, a Stanford. Um, intern fellow for the summer who uh, just received her master's degree uh, from Stanford. And she's really um, providing some extraordinarily innovative and new ideas for our program. So it's absolutely a place that young people should be looking at. And um, we've also uh, made made one of our areas of focus working with emerging leaders. Um, we're actually looking uh, right now. So sneak peek um, at hopefully by the time the podcast is, is out there, we'll be we'll have launched this. But we're launching a um, a new competition in advance of the Kampala Global Health Security Agenda um, uh, Ministerial, which will be held in October. And the purpose of the competition is to get additional interest within the Next Generation Global Health Security Network, which is an emerging um, an emerging network for, for young professionals interested in the health and security uh, interface. And the idea is to get some innovative new ideas uh, where one of the criteria for the competition will be that the emerging leaders need to be working within their country across different sectors, so sectors of government or sectors of research, um, or they need to be working with different countries as part of the, the one of the criteria for a successful proposal. And then um, we're, we're really hopeful to be able to do some additional work um, to engage next generation leaders as we as we launch additional efforts over the next year. Okay, great. We'll uh, put up a put up a link to that if it's if it's up by now. Uh, turning now to pandemics in general, uh, obviously, there's a, there's a lot of different security problems that humanity faces, uh, you like listed some of them is it nuclear and biological, uh, like just just war in general. Um, is, is pandemic preparedness one of the biggest security threats uh, we face in your view? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, biological risk is absolutely increasing in both likelihood and import. Um, and what I mean by that is that we have um, different, a much different environment today than, for example, we had in 1918 during the pandemic um, influenza that most people um, have read about and which we're coming up on the 100th anniversary um, for next year in 2018. Um, we have air travel, we have increasing conflict and migration, we have increasing urbanization and bringing together of traditionally agricultural societies with urban communities. And then we have growing terrorist interest in weapons of mass destruction. All of these things um, really, in my view, uh, make pandemic preparedness uh, increasingly important in the biological threat. One of the 21st century transnational threats that absolutely needs to be on the agenda, in my view, in every major leader's conversation. Um, and up front, I'd also say that because society is changing in these ways that are that are likely um, to make a biological event spread uh, more quickly and potentially um, to create new uh, biological agents and to modify them using advances in technology, um, we need to do a much better job at coming together across different sectors of society and government as we prepare for this threat. We can't we can't really afford to be looking at this as a public health threat or a national security threat. It absolutely needs to be both, and it needs to be both in every conversation. I guess the, the last um, thing that I'd say about that is just to make a, a little bit of a comparison. Um, if you're thinking about an outbreak as a fire, as a smoldering fire um, somewhere in the world, then the global preparedness system really needs to work like a smoke detector. It's a lot easier to stop a fire from spreading at the smoke detection stage than it is when it becomes a five alarm blaze when you have fire trucks that need to be called in from all over the world. And that's what really happened during Ebola. Uh, 11,000 people died as a result um, with over 20,000 people infected. Um, and really that kind of outbreak can be stopped at the source the way that it is regularly in countries like Uganda, um, with just a little bit of focus on preparedness. And so we have some critical challenges that we're still facing. So, for example, during periods of crisis, we tend to, as a government and as a world, we tend to provide funding and oversight uh, for these areas. But when outbreaks um, aren't, aren't really on the horizon, we tend to decline in our in our area of interest. And the World Bank and others have called this the cycle of panic and neglect. Um, and during those cycles of neglect, which we're, we're currently um, in, believe it or not, um, in, in those cycles of neglect, those are the times when you need to be focusing on preparedness the most, because it's very difficult to be thinking about what you need to do to get prepared when you're in the middle of a crisis. 
We were really lucky um, during President Obama's administration that we were able to create the global health security agenda at the beginning, during, and then carrying through after the Ebola crisis. But I would say that that's really rare, um, and it, it's um, it's an area that needs to, to continue to be focused on even when there's not a crisis in front of us. In addition, there's really um, not an adequate level of pandemic financing, even in the United States. We don't have a pandemic emergency response fund. Threat awareness is, I would say, very low um, around the world with many heads of state. Ebola is certainly helpful. But again, as I mentioned, we're, we're hitting into a cycle of neglect now. And then there's also not a lot of creative financing mechanisms. When countries are faced with whether they need a road or whether they need a strong health system, sometimes the road wins. And it's very hard for governments to make those choices and to make informed choices. And those are all things that I think um, we should be able to tackle and do a much better job um, as a global community addressing. So we'll come back to a lot of those uh, policy questions uh, later on in the episode. I just wanted to um, talk about about one thing you raised. So it seems like the the risks from dual-use technology, so uh, new technologies that we're inventing that that could be used both for for good uh, and to cause harm, that's that's definitely uh, going up because we're just inventing quite a lot of uh, kind of scary things at the moment. But then when it comes to to natural pandemics, is it it definitely the case that we are at greater risk from them today than we were, uh, you know, 100 years ago when we had the the Spanish flu just after World War I? Because there's various ways that the situation is is scarier, that we have a lot more air travel so diseases can spread much more quickly. But on the other hand, we have... uh, you know, better, better healthcare system. Uh, hopefully, better, better processes for uh, you know controlling new diseases and, and sanitation methods. So, um, so it's a little bit unclear to me whether whether the, the risk today is, is higher than it would look in the historical record or lower. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. It's one that I hesitate to give you a a, a really quantitative answer to. But I would say that I, I agree with your analysis that there are um, a number of things uh, that are changing the landscape and increasing the risk. Also, healthcare is definitely improving. But I would say. Um, just uh, focusing for a second on the emerging technology question, where, where we will definitely spend a little more time. Um, I think that it is true today that that we can see a future where it will be increasingly easy to create pathogens. The question about whether um, people will create them and create them for ill purpose is one that it's hard to speculate on. I think you can always say, um, that it, it's more likely that the good will outweigh the bad purposes. And of course, we need we need technology um, in order to get to the society that we all want to live in. But I think that it is definitely true that today there's an increasing ability both in the laboratories and um, out in the world from people that might might wish to do to do uh, society harm that now, um, as opposed to any other time before, the ability to create something for which we don't have a countermeasure um, has certainly uh, increased. And I think the recent um, discovery of the of the ability to create horsepox, which portends the ability to create smallpox, um, a disease that we've eradicated, uh, is definitely yet another wake up call for how we need to be focusing on the ability to be prepared for literally anything that comes our way. So you've looked at a lot of different uh, kinds of threats through your career, from from natural diseases to, to bioterrorism to to these to these uh, accidents with new technologies. What what kind of scenario worries you the, the most today? All of them. And, <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny. Um, in all seriousness, I think the thing about biological threats is that preparing for naturally occurring disease threats, which obviously has great benefits here and now for people around the world who are dying here and now, um, that preparedness is, is almost equally applicable to preparedness for accidental and intentional threats. And so the, um, the importance of, of being prepared for, for biological threats that we might, uh, we might not have a countermeasure for, um, preparedness in a country will also help us handle, uh, those kinds of outbreaks that we do have a countermeasure for or can be more readily prepared for or even be more prepared to predict. So, um, I'm worried about all of them. And I think the, for me, the, the take home message is that we have to be worried about all of them at the same time. Um, and the good news is that most of the things that the world needs to do to prepare are the same. So, Focusing on what those things are, how to prioritize them, how to fund them, and how to measure impact, those things are the places where I think we need to spend spend the time. Um, I spent most of my career bringing together in some way, shape, or form representatives from the health community and the security community, and I consider myself to really have one foot in both camps as a biologist that's working in national security. And the, the place where, we, where we're able to make um, the, the most impact um, as a community working together is on um, the problem as a sum total, uh, as any kind of biological threat that might come our way, and then how it actually comes our way. Um, there are certainly um, other disciplines focusing on those things, but when we can come together and look at the whole picture and determine where to make the most impact, we're, we're definitely in the best in the best place. So are there any specific dual-use technologies that scare you? 
you know, I think I think the technologies themselves don't actually scare me. What scares me um, is the separation of the communities that develop and apply new biotechnologies from communities that are really doing a lot of thinking about the risk. I think a lot of progress has been made to bring those communities together. But I think for the most part that as around the world, as new technologies are conceived of and new applications are developed, there's probably not an adequate um, discussion or training about what the downstream impacts might be. And I'm not an advocate of stopping technology. I am an advocate of thinking about the technology and the impacts of that technology while the technology is under development and before it becomes democratized. And I think, I think that, um, that one area where a lot more work could usefully be done is working with the innovators themselves to come up with ways that they can make an impact on security. And that includes considering the experiments in advance, but it also includes technology itself, new biosecurity related technologies that can actually help impact the risk as the technologies are being created. So um, so I think uh, the technologies themselves don't scare me so much, but, uh, but the, the fact that um, they're often created in a vacuum uh, without a, um, an adequate understanding of the risk, that scares me a little bit. So why aren't you in favor of uh, stopping the development of some technologies? I've noticed that uh, whenever you bring up this issue of uh, dual-use technology, technologies that could be extremely uh, risky for civilization as a, as a whole, uh, people are usually very quick to say, oh, but I don't want to prevent these things from being developed. And sometimes I think uh, maybe, maybe we should just have a moratorium on, on particular... Because sometimes I think that idea gets dismissed a little bit, a little bit too quickly, or, or perhaps people don't want to take it seriously because it would be seen as, as too adversarial. But there, there might just be some technologies that... Uh, humanity just isn't uh, mature enough yet to to deal with, and it would be better if we you know, didn't didn't give research funding to them, and, and perhaps it could be developed, you know, in fifty or a hundred years when we're when we're in a better position to uh, anticipate the risks and, and deal with them. Yeah, I I like this question a lot because I think it really gets to the heart of of um, of some of the debates that different communities are having. So. I can def I can conceive of a, a technology some somewhere in the future that someone wants to develop where some really smart people in the world potentially who've been given um, who've been given a mandate to actually look at risk in real time as technologies are being developed might say whoa wait a minute we should think about this um, right now though what I'd say is that we need we need most of the, the tech, the dual use biotechnologies that are being developed are absolutely going to be essential to solving the biological threats that we're worried about them creating. And so that creates a conundrum. And so a specific example is the ability to, you know, create and modify DNA has absolutely been transformative in our ability to create drugs and vaccines that will counter biological threats that could be created by using the same technologies. And so understanding that we absolute that in my view, we absolutely need these technologies to get to those countermeasures if we're not if we're not in a world yet where we can create a medical countermeasure on demand and distribute it equitably around the world quickly. So what that means is that in the meantime, we definitely need to have mechanisms for assessing risk um, as we go. And and I think um, to, to answer your question more, more succinctly, I think the first thing that we don't have is we don't have a global mechanism for discussing these issues. We have national mechanisms. And so as one concrete example, the United States did decide while I was in the White House to um, put forward a moratorium on certain types of research with um, SARS, MERS, and flu, dual-use research, gain-of-function research. Um, and we did that because in 2014 and 2015, there was a series of biosafety-related incidents that really rocked public trust um, in, in U.S. ability to handle pathogens safely and securely. And that included finding the smallpox samples um, on the Bethesda NIH campus that were historical, um, finding that also included some anthrax biosafety incidents at CDC, and then the Department of Defense mailing, um, inadvertently mailing, in not uh, inadequately inactivated, the three eyes, um, uh, anthrax to laboratories around the world. And Taken together, one of the policy measures that came out of those discussions was a decision to put a moratorium on funding for certain types of, of, of research, um, which then um, the moratorium was then lifted with the uh, with the uh, putting out of a new policy in early 2017 by the Obama administration that um, that deals with uh, adequate oversight for path for enhanced uh, for research with enhanced pathogens of pandemic potential. And I think that policy is a good start. But one of my points in saying all of this isn't that we shouldn't consider moratoriums in certain cases when we don't have policy in place. In fact, I was a proponent of that moratorium, but globally there is no mechanism to do that. And so when the U.S. stops funding something, that doesn't mean that the rest of the world does, or when any country stops funding something, that doesn't mean the rest of the world does. And so 
the thing that I think is most challenging, but also the, the place where I think we need to um, put a lot more emphasis is creating ways for global scientific leaders to come up with um, to come up with uh, meaningful ways to assess risk and to have the kind of conversation about um, tough topics like moratorium, like risk mitigation, like new biosecurity tools. Um, I think that's really missing and we really need to rectify that. Are you worried that if the United States stops funding something, then that, that dangerous research would just move to uh, another country that's uh, more irresponsible, basically, and doesn't have as good a safety record? Yeah, I'm. I am. I am worried that when um, I'm worried that responsible science uh, means uh, talking about these kinds of questions, and it's not just the United States having these kinds of conversations. There's many uh, countries around the world having the conversation about dual use risk and governance um, nationally, and also on on a global stage. But I think um, that it is absolutely true that when good leaders abdicate uh, abdicate that leadership role by not funding research in general or uh, not looking at how they can continue to work in a certain space in a responsible manner, um, what, what you end up losing is leadership on developing the norms. So if you lead in a certain research area, you have the ability to actually develop safety and security protocols in a credible way. That said, I, I do, again, uh, think that um, that there's a great opportunity right now to bring together the community. I think there's um, every every few years there seems to be an, an incident, um, an event, a specific uh, new tool that's developed that puts everybody's eye on on this topic. And the creation of horsepox is is really another one of those times. And I think we can we as a community should capitalize on on that and um, and use it as a way to to garner a new global conversation at a, a very high level. Um, and I don't mean high level of government, though high levels of government should be involved. I mean, um, innovators should be looking at this. The, the future Nobel laureates of the world should be the ones leading these conversations. Tell me more about this horse box. I haven't heard about it. Yeah, so... Um, it, the actual research itself hasn't been published yet, but there's been a, a number of reports about about the research and the fact that it occurred. Um, so um, uh, David Evans, uh, an orthopox researcher in Canada, um, has created uh, horsepox, which was a previously extinct uh, pox orthopox virus. And the speculation, so the, the research itself is not technically surprising. Um, pox virologists have, have and others have speculated for years that the creation of orthopox viruses like like horsepox and smallpox um, was now possible by by um, by good researchers, but the fact that it was done really um, it basically creates a new new uh, new life to the argument that um, that smallpox can be created from scratch and the ability to create smallpox from scratch I think reopens uh, the question about uh, democratization of synthetic biology and technology and the ability of of bad actors to potentially create things like smallpox um, which have heretofore been eradicated. Should I go get a smallpox vaccination? Should everyone go get a smallpox vaccination? I don't think we're at that point. Um, <laughs> not quite yet. But but I think I think so. Just to 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 not maybe not to 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 laugh about it too much. I think that um, these are the kinds of questions. If you eradicate a disease and make decisions such as the decision that was made um, the year that I was born in 1972 to stop vaccinating, so I'm not I'm not vaccinated for smallpox. Um, those decisions get made because the, the risk of being vaccinated and the adverse reactions in a small fraction of the population um, are greater than the likelihood that the d disease um, the disease is going to emerge and spread again. And so the ability to make something from scratch and potentially even modify it to evade the current countermeasures that we have in place, that really, um, that really changes the calculus about what kinds of vaccines, who gets vaccinated, and what the likelihood is. And, you, and then you have to, of course, think about the risk. And, and um, I'm definitely uh, not the one who should be uh, making that risk calculation. But um, as, as things continue to grow and democratize, we, we're going to be faced with a whole different situation um, for making that risk calculation than we had in the past. So at 80,000 hours, we worry a lot about the very worst case scenarios where uh, billions of people die in some kind of biological disaster. That's because an event like that would have ripple effects on future generations that could last hundreds or thousands of years or really even be permanent. Uh, whereas a natural pandemic that kills just a few thousand people or, or even a few million uh, probably wouldn't. We'll, we'll just recover from, from that uh, you know, within, within a couple of years or maybe a few decades. Is that a perspective that NTI takes seriously? Yes, ab absolutely. So one of the, 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 um, the important things about NTI is that we look at nuclear, chemical, radiological, biological, and cyber threats across a relatively small organization. So we spend a lot of time thinking about worst case scenarios. We spend a lot of time thinking about nuclear scenarios and, and what might cause mi miscalculation with nuclear weapons, for example. And so I, I do think that a significant um, biological event, whether it's naturally occurring or deliberately cause, caused, um, could result in downstream impacts that actually make it 
even a much uh, a much more serious uh, event that would have ripple effects on future generations. And so, um, one of course that I that I think about, especially from NTI's perspective, is that a biological event could happen in an area that's already unstable um, that could actually lead to a nuclear miscalculation, depending on where where it happens in the world. Of course, you can also look at um, some more traditional scenarios that I think would have some serious downstream impacts on future generations if you consider where they happen and the fact that a large number of people in one part of the world um, that happens to be unstable, um, migrating in the middle of a war. But in terms of absolute numbers, one of the the um, with one of the the challenging things about biological threats is that it's very hard to predict for any given scenario how many people would die um, simply because um, depending on where it starts, where it spreads, who gets on which plane, where, uh, where it's launched, where it's released, um, where it emerges or how it emerges, all of those things um, could greatly impact the absolute numbers and the, and the rapid response. And so the really important thing is that all countries really need to be able to quickly detect um, and stop outbreaks at the source before they become um, epidemics. So, um, and in addition to that, um, we really need to be much better prepared to respond in real time uh, than we were during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Um, and I, I just also want to give some some credit here to the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. They recently published a working definition of global catastrophic biological risk, um, which I think is worth looking at. They they questioned whether absolute numbers um, were necessarily the most important thing, but they did say that such events um, were those that could lead to sudden, extraordinary, widespread disaster beyond the collective capability of national and international governments and the private sector could, to control, and that if unchecked, global catastrophic biological risks would lead to great suffering, loss of life, and sustained damage to national governments, international relationships, economies, societal stability, or global security. And I think this is the first time that, in, at least as far as I know, that any organization has tried to define um, global catastrophic biological risk. And I think it's really important as a community working across different um, different disciplines, including um, organizations like 80,000 Hours that are looking at really severe downstream impacts, which is absolutely important, um, and um, looking at health organizations that are looking at any epidemic anywhere in the world that might kill a much smaller number of people, but would certainly be significant and devastating like the Ebola epidemic was. I think it's really important for the community to continue to discuss that how we can work together. Um, there's not enough organizations working in this area, and so I think it's really important that we that we look at the problem, dissect it, and, and figure out where we can make the most impact. Hmm. My sense is the intelligence services in the U.S. at least uh, are not as focused on the worst case scenarios as, as I think they ought to be. That, um, that there's been a lot of work put into controlling uh, anthrax, for example, because anthrax was actually used in the, in the early 2000s. But I'm about 100 times as concerned about smallpox as I am about anthrax, because uh, anthrax, as a lot of listeners uh, may, may, may know, uh, doesn't, doesn't replicate itself. It doesn't spread from person to person. So you produce the, the, this toxin, and then you can, you can kill a bunch of people with it. But there's no way that you can have a global pandemic of, of anthrax, even though it's, it comes from a biological agent. Do, do you think that the government as a whole is maybe too concerned about things that have already happened that are, that are smaller risks and maybe not concerned about things that haven't happened that could could be enormously uh, damaging. Yeah, so I'll just um, I'll just comment from my own perspective. There's a couple of different types of of biological threats um, when you look at it at, at, at an intentional threat um, scenario, and there's th threats that have been used in the past and emerging types of threats um, like the ability to create something new from scratch, like we were talking about earlier with with smallpox and horsepox. Um, and I think that uh, currently our our governance, for the most part, certainly in the United States, is geared at our ability to handle threat agents um, from a list of specific pathogens. And um, I definitely don't dismiss the anthrax threat. I think in terms of the ability to cause fear and panic, um, it was pretty effective in 2001. Um, and I think, you know, multiple anthrax attacks happening at once, um, modified, I mean, I think there's there's some pretty some pretty terrible things that it could occur um, with anthrax, and it's also sitting in most veterinary laboratories around the world um, and understanding where, where it is and how to minimize um, dangerous pathogen storage while maximizing countries' ability to do good public health and biosurveillance is another um, important element of global health security. But I think that it is really important. You uncovered a, a really important um, issue in your question, which is we are, we are much better prepared to handle, deal with, oversee, um, assess risk associated with specific lists of agents. When you start getting into new types of agents or new types of materials, um, when you start getting into modified agents um, in different ways, um, it's much it's much more difficult to assess an experiment and look at risk, and it's much more difficult to figure out exactly how you'd respond. So I think 
that we definitely are entering an era where rethinking how we look at pathogens with pandemic potential is, is going to be increasingly important. Um, I do think that, um, at least speaking from my experience in the government, I do think that that the U.S. government and most governments that I've dealt with around the world, um, and frankly, most citizens, are, are adequately concerned about pandemics. I think that the, the challenge is that when you talk about um, where policy gets made, where financial get decisions get put into place, when heads of state are talking about other issues, including uh, terrorism, including climate change, including um, cybersecurity, um, including nuclear security, often biosecurity, unless you're in the middle of an issue of a pandemic um, like H1N1, or if you're in the middle of the Ebola crisis, it often falls um, closer to the bottom of the list. And um, one of the things that I, I found absolutely from working in the White House is that when something is at the top of the list, and, and global health security was, was at the top of the list for a long time in the Obama administration, you can get a number of things done and you can get a lot more emphasis put in place. And so I think in, in order to, to tackle the issue of how to best be prepared for the pandemics that uh, that um, that will cause mass instability and chaos, um, in order to be prepared, it needs to be at the top of the list. And it absolutely should be on the agenda, along with those other issues that I mentioned in, in every in every large uh, gathering of, of leaders. There are a bunch of factors that can lower biodefense, like uh, sloppy security in, in laboratories or excessive uh, human contact with uh, animals in farms or in, in nature. Uh, are there any of these that worry you in particular? Well, I'd like to answer the other question. I, I worry about all of them. It's my, <laughs> it's my job. It's what they pay me to do. Um, but I do think uh, that the um, the one of the things that I, I am concerned about um, is laboratory security. And I think laboratory security is often when, when you say those two words together, people immediately think of guns, guards and gates. I think also of just, you know, how a laboratory system is put into place and how that laboratory system takes advantage of new technologies that can actually help to detect threats early, um, how samples are transported safely and securely, how reference laboratories um, can that can confirm um, can confirm samples and how that whole system taken together um, leads a, a government or leads um, a whole system, including the academic and the governmental laboratories in a country, to understand where pathogens are, what kinds of research are being conducted, what kind of training is put in place. Um, and frankly, there's a number of, um, of programs around the world, including in the U.S., but also in other countries um, that are that are focused on, on biosecurity um, that have looked at biosecurity for a very long period of time. And one of the, the great things that happened over the last couple of years is the world really came together on a set of metrics for biosecurity under the global health security agenda and as part of the joint external evaluations of the World Health Organization. And this is a process that really created metrics for implementing the international health regulations, which all countries um, signed up to be prepared to, to, to implement by 2012, but which by 2012, only less than 20% of countries were actually prepared to implement. One of the reasons they weren't prepared to implement them is because they, people didn't really understand what full implementation meant and how to measure it. In addition, biosecurity and laboratory security was not explicitly factored in to the international health regulations uh, when they were put in place. And so um, now, through uh, work that has been done uh, by a number of countries over the past couple of years, the, um, the process for externally evaluating countries for IHR implementation includes a set of biosecurity metrics. And you could argue that they should get better, and I would argue that there's more indicators that could be added to that list. But um, but for the first time, uh, that list actually exists and countries are able to, to assess themselves and importantly, be assessed by others and publish those evaluations so that we know um, how they're doing on biosecurity and most importantly, so that they know and so that the gaps can actually be filled. So that's one area I'm, I'm, I'm particularly worried about. Hmm. What kinds of uh, metrics go, go into that measure of, uh, of their performance? Yeah. So um, some of the questions that are included are, um, do you have, an, does the country have an inventory of dangerous pathogens uh, stored and, and where they are in the country? Um, another one of the metrics that's involved is, um, is whether they've been consolidated into a minimal number of laboratories. Um, another metric is whether effective uh, modern diagnostics are being implemented as a way to decrease reliance on culturing and storing dangerous pathogens, but maximizing technologies that can actually um, detect threats earlier. So these are just some examples. Um, there's also training metrics for whether there's a common curriculum across institutions where, um, where scientists are, and public health officials are trained to work with dangerous pathogens. Is there a common curriculum? Um, and uh, is there an adequate training program and a train the trainer program in place in the country? And there's also metrics for biosafety. I certainly don't want to rule out biosafety as an, as an important and critical element, um, especially when you're dealing with accidental risk.
Mm. So uh, what's the definition of biosafety? How, how are these terms all different? Yeah, so um, so the, the shorthand for bio, definition for biosafety and biosecurity is um, biosafety is the measures that are put in place to protect people that are working with pathogens from becoming uh, infected. Biosecurity are the measures that are put in place to protect the pathogens from people that might want to misuse them or do them harm. And so biosecurity includes things like um, insider threat prevention. Um, it includes, um, uh, for example, um, uh, understanding who's working with the pathogens. It includes um, having inventories that not everyone might have access to. So uh, speaking of which, uh, how do you feel about the uh, mutant uh, bird flu uh, fiasco? In, or maybe you could call it a fiasco, maybe not, uh, in 2012. But this was a case where some uh, biomedical researchers in the Netherlands and, and Japan, if I recall correctly, uh, developed uh, a strain of bird flu that uh, was contagious uh, in, in ferrets uh, in a way that, uh, it, that, that this, this strain of flu had never been contagious uh, in, in humans before. And ferrets are apparently a reasonably good model of contagiousness in, in humans. And there was a lot of outrage at the fact that they had created a, a very virulent and probably uh, transmissible uh, strain of flu that, that if it escaped the lab and, and infected humans could have spread around the world and killed you know, even hundreds of millions, po possibly uh, billions of people. Uh, so there, there, was, there was a lot of outcry in the scientific community and there was a moratorium on this kind of uh, research for a while. Uh, and, and it got people thinking a lot about the, these problems with, with dual use research. But uh, Howie, uh, when I spoke uh, with him, thought that probably the research was, was worth doing because it uh, allowed us to uh, foresee what kinds of diseases uh, might evolve and uh, begin preparing uh, to deal with them or, pr or producing vaccines. Do, do you have a view? Yeah. So, so first, I would say, um, so one of the research groups was actually in the United States. So it was the United uh -huh. States and and Erasmus University uh, in the Netherlands. And um, you know, one of one of the things that I, I won't do is I'm not I won't go back and forth and parse the research itself. There was there were so many different conversations about it. Um, amongst the scientific community that I don't want to sort of Monday morning quarterback with where they came out with publishing the research. But one of the things that actually came out of, of that was the United States oversight system for dual use research of concern. So before those experiments um, uh, came to light and before the discussion that happened in our own National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, which is the organization off of the National Institutes of Health that um, that was asked to address this issue and whether the research, um, you know, whether the re there should be a moratorium on publishing this research, that that um, the deliberations of that group and the involvement of the U.S. government in thinking about this as it was happening and then after the fact led to the development of um, of a federal policy in the U.S. Uh, and also a policy um, in the U.S. also, but for each institution that receives uh, any federal funding to look at dual use research of concern. And one of the things that I think was really important about those policies is that it created a mechanism for institutions, for universities to actually um, train students to look at different types of case studies from a very practical perspective as research was being conceived. And so I think that's really important. And it led to a really, um, a really Im important shift in the way that, that we train um, students who, who might be working with dual use research of concern. That said, um, that policy is also based on a specific list of agents. And one of the reasons for that is because it's very challenging to think of exactly what you would put on the list if you didn't have a list of agents. But I think coming back to an area that we discussed earlier, we know um, now that we're in a world where the threats that we face are not limited to specific types of agents. I think um, if I think that when those experiments were done, another important uh, factor was was that there wasn't a mechanism for having that conversation uh, within the U.S. or globally. So um, the world was sort of taken by surprise by the controversy associated with those two research groups and the papers that were coming out. And I think that while we've made some progress, there's still a tremendous um, uh, capable. There's still a tremendous potential for surprise within the governmental and scientific community. And I'm not sure that we've created a mechanism uh, that would lead to less surprise if something uh, new came down the pike tomorrow. And so I, I do think that we need to consider what that what that way of dealing with surprise might be, and also how we can get to a place where we might be less surprised. Mm. Are there any hostile groups like terrorist organizations that we know are interested in developing biological weapons? So what I would say about this is that uh, terrorists are opportunistic. Um, and so I won't, I won't comment on any you know, specific groups uh, that might be more or less interested, because I think the truth is we just don't know. Um, we do know um, that terrorists want to wreak havoc uh, and panic and harm. Um, and we know that chemical weapons have been unfortunately increasingly used and so one of the things that really keeps me up at night is the possibility that any group might decide to try to use or create a biological weapon. And even if the the, the attack uh, wasn't 
wasn't perfect and didn't cause much harm, I, I really worry that if there's a proof of concept for a biological attack uh, being done by a terrorist group, that others might decide that it's worth investigating that. And I think that if it becomes uh, something that groups are interested in and, and try to develop, I think that could create a very a very difficult problem um, for the world to deal with. And so that is that is definitely an area that I that I that I am concerned about. Mm. You could have copycat attempts. Yeah, uh, copycat attempts, but and and I think um, moreover, just um, interest in biological weapons as a viable way to cause fear and panic. So for whatever reason, um, they're they're not currently being used, and that's a really good thing. Um, and I would like to keep it that way. When I spoke with Howie in the previous episode, uh, he described how the uh, various agencies that formed the the global health community uh, wake up gradually when a new disease uh, is detected. But it sounded like a dismayingly slow process as countries haggle over who's going to contribute and figure out what they're actually going to do. Uh, that there isn't kind of a ready amount of money just sitting there that can be activated immediately as soon as uh, there's a new pandemic threat. And within the US, it sounded like there was a lot of different agencies, some, some with a healthcare focus, some with a security focus, um, where there was a bit of diffusion of responsibility between them. And it wasn't entirely clear who would be leading the response if there was a new serious disease that was spreading in the US or, or globally. Is that an accurate picture? And uh, if so, what, what can we do to, to improve the situation? Yeah, I think I think largely it, it is a bit of an accurate picture um, with respect to Ebola. I think what, one of the things that Howie was putting his finger, finger on is the fact that well, there's a couple of things. One, um, the World Health Organization uh, is an organization that the world was sort of relying on to be able to raise the al alarm bell. And when WHO um, wasn't uh, as effective in that particular case at doing that, there wasn't really a fallback uh, mechanism. There were, in fact, a lot of meetings, um, and there was a lot of discussion about about who should do which thing. Furthermore, when it became absolutely clear that there was a situation in West Africa that a number of countries were going to have to to, to jump into in a very serious way, um, it, it also uh, wasn't clear how the world was going to des decide who was going to do what and how those contributions were going to work. And uh, further compounding that from the U.S. perspective, we are, in fact, um, we do, in fact, have different agencies responsible for domestic and international um, issues. And in some cases, the same agencies with different pieces um, involved, like CDC, for example, is both uh, critically important to our public health response in the U.S. and our ability to respond and help assist others to be prepared overseas. And so I, I don't um, because I've been part of that community for a long time and I, I watched um, think I worked. I watched situations where it worked incredibly well to bring all of those agencies together, and then I also have seen uh, situations where it was much more difficult. I would say that the the number one um, the number one uh, thing that has to happen uh, in every country in the world and in the United States is exercise. Um, we we absolutely need to exercise who's going to be on first in which situation and how it's going to work. Um, out of Ebola, we were able to make great strides in our ability for USAID and CDC to build disaster assistance response teams, um, which are the way in which USAID responds to other types of crises um, overseas, like earthquakes um, and, and other uh, disasters, famines, um, refugee crises, et cetera. Um, and to be able to create a plug-in for that, uh, for, the ep for the epidemiology pieces that have to happen in the case of an outbreak to work with, for example, CDC. And so Developing a toolkit that could be easily exercised and, and readily deployed um, was definitely one of the lessons learned out of Ebola for the United States. Another lesson learned uh, out of the Ebola crisis was the need to have high level, um, a high level uh, person in the U.S. government responsible for handling uh, um, a biological crisis. And uh, that person... Um, for the Ebola crisis was Ron Klain, um, the Ebola response coordinator. And coming out of that, um, hereafter, it was the Deputy Homeland Security Advisor, Amy Pope. And that's a lesson learned um, that the Obama administration passed on uh, to the Trump administration, the need to have a high-level uh, point person in place for an emergency that can rapidly bring together other parts of the government and to be able to um, to, to specifically um, be the person where the buck stops uh, in the case of a, of a biological emergency, um, it, the last thing that I'll that I'll say on this is that it's also important um, to have um, to have a uh, very robust um, and quick ability to finance um, the needs that that inevitably occur during a biological crisis. And so, one of the things um, that Ron Klain frequently mentions when he talks about lessons learned from Ebola is that for hurricanes and floods and fires in the U.S., we have FEMA, the Federal Emergency uh, Response Agency. Um, and he, he has frequently um, said that what we also need is a P-H-E-M-A, a FEMA, that, that is 
uh, responsible for um, for dealing with a public health emergency. Um, I'm not sure if we need to create a new agency called FEMA. We have um, a very strong assistance. We have a very strong um, uh, legislative mandate within HHS to have an assistant secretary for preparedness and response. Um, but I think that element of, of our government, the ability to step in and really lead on any public health related emergency really needs to, to happen. And, and that person um, in whatever administration we have has to be uh, really well empowered to be able to do that job with very strong leadership from the White House, which will inevitably be, in, be involved. You're saying we need to do basically simulations both within the US and internationally where we imagine that there's a pandemic and then everyone tries to respond and they, they see what goes wrong and then they can fix that. So when it's really going on, they uh, the, the, the systems are well oiled and actually function. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to be bold about how we're thinking about those types of um, discussions, too, where it's not just here's a list of the things that we didn't do well or we wouldn't do well. It's here's some really um, some really innovative ways for solving that kind of problem. And the global community can do this. You know, recently, the the. Um, Recently, a number of countries and international, um, sorry, and non-governmental organizations came together and created CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, which is looking at new ways to quickly create and rapidly and equitably distribute uh, vaccines and, and countermeasures um, for, for, um, for specific diseases. And these types of public-private partnerships where um, where we're thinking uh, creatively about, about how to solve a problem and also not waiting forever to do it, um, we need to do more of that. Mm. I know that in reaction to the to the World Health Organization's slow response to the Ebola pandemic in 2014, there were there were calls for for major reforms, which you kind of alluded to. Uh, what what are they, and, and how are they going? Yeah, so there were there were a number of different things called for. I'll just focus on a, a, a couple of them. Um, one uh, was really. Um, focused with, within and internally at the World Health Organization itself um, with its own ability to deal with a, with a health emergency. And the new emergency department um, that's been put in place, um, by all accounts, is, is doing a better job. Um, and uh, ideally, in the case of, of the next um, major outbreak, will be able to show the kind of leadership that WHO really needs to show in a crisis. So um, that reform definitely underway, definitely um, a big change in centralizing those functions within the WHO. But I would say um, not uh, not uh, tested in a huge emergency um, as of yet. So um, we need to continue to to work uh, together on that and to make sure that 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 um, that department is is as successful as it needs to be. Um, funding for emergency response. I don't think we're doing uh, as well on that front. Uh, just speaking uh, in the U.S., we don't have. Um, an emergency response fund that is well um, well oiled and ready to go in the event of a crisis. And there's a contingency fund, fund at WHO, and I think that um, that a number of countries have actually contributed to it. But I would also say that it's not clear to me that that all countries are going to contribute to um, a centralized fund because there's going to be different ways to implement in a crisis, some of which might be quicker uh, than going directly through WHO. And so I think all countries need to have uh, mechanisms for quickly responding, and there needs to be more creative mechanisms for doing it. So I'm not sure where I don't think we're where we need to be um, on that front. We mentioned uh, personnel and ways in which to to do a um, to do a better job with uh, creating um, what some have called uh, a white helmets core of people who might actually uh, respond. Um, it's another controversial topic that that many uh, people have discussed, but it hasn't really uh, moved a huge step forward, as far as I'm aware, in in figuring out how how we will um, we will muster the type of response. And I've also I've spoken with a number of clinicians who are concerned um, that there aren't adequate ways to uh, rapidly assess an outbreak from a clinical perspective um, and to be able to um, to organize the, the kind of, of, uh, of treatment that we would need for a crisis that might be uh, even worse than, than the Ebola crisis that we faced. So I think we still have more to do there. Some areas where I think we've made, made some progress as I mentioned, um, the global health security agenda was actually launched before the first cases of Ebola in Guinea came to light to focus on on, um, on country preparedness. And one of the things that came out of that effort was a set of metrics uh, for countries to measure how they're doing on different aspects of preventing, detecting, and response um, to, to pandemic threats. And that led to something that was very difficult um, to see a path forward to uh, before Ebola, which is an external evaluation mechanism. And it sounds a little bit wonky, but um, just to, to give some perspective here, before the Ebola crisis, countries were me largely measuring how prepared they were for a pandemic threat by doing a self-assessment that they then reported to WHO without using the same metrics. And so we had 194 WHO member states all reporting to WHO, not publishing the results, not using the same metrics, um, and, um, and usually reporting only from the health department's perspective, not the whole-of-government approach that you need uh, to understand whether you're prepared for a pandemic. 
Now, um, a couple of years later, there's a mechanism um, that includes uh, cross-ministerial external evaluation where experts from different countries around the world come into the country, do an assessment, working with that country over at least a week's time, running through a series of common metrics across 19 different target areas that are important for, for public health emergency preparedness, and then publishing the results. And so far, over 50 countries have actually done this external evaluation, including the U.S., um, which signed on early to make the point that we needed to walk the walk. Um, and so a lot of progress has been made on that front. Um, but the next big thing that really needs to be uh, paid attention to is how the gaps that are being elucidated through these assessments are going to get filled. Um, again, figuring out how to finance filling the gaps, how countries can put in their own funding, but also leverage donor and private sector funding in a much more um, organized fashion and developing ways to actually catalyze that. I think that's going to be a, a really important thing on the horizon. Mm. You were involved in the White House's response to Ebola, to the Ebola outbreak in 2013-14, right? Yes. Yeah. Tell me about that. Was it, I guess it was both exciting and terrifying. Yeah, it was both exciting and terrifying. And I, I will admit this. I am, I've worked in a, in a field for the last 13 years since I've been in government that is uh, relatively scary. So working on cooperative threat reduction for nuclear chemical and biological threats. And I'm usually still able to go to sleep at night uh, and to sleep through the night. Um, I certainly have days that give me more or less stress. But during the Ebola crisis, I actually lost sleep and I was certainly not alone. Um, and um, I was not one of the heroic people that went to those three countries on multiple occasions and treated patients. Um, and I met many of those people who did that. And I've met many of the even more heroic people who live in those three countries and went back again and again um, to, to help communities and to do literally everything that could be done. Um, but I lost a lot of sleep and I uh, I saw the absolute best uh, in government during during that crisis where people pulled together, where there was no um, no distinction between levels, where every morning I, I had a meeting with the highest levels of our government to talk about what more could possibly be done, what more data we could get. And the things that left me frustrated and my colleagues frustrated on a regular basis, fortunately, had nothing to do with people or with the, the extraordinary um, humans that we had a chance to work with. It was the, the lack of systems that we just didn't have yet, uh, the inability to get really strong data that was analyzed quickly in a crisis um, is another big gap um, elucidated during Ebola that hasn't been filled and without that kind of data and the models that were needed, um, just the feeling that we were always one step behind this virus, that we didn't know exactly where it was going to be, that whatever we could throw at it might not be good enough. Um, and that was incredibly disheartening um, and scary. But at the same time, we saw a situation where every element of our government and governments around the world um, stepped up to the plate where we had Operation United Assistance with the Department of Defense sending in people to help with command and control, where we had the Monrovia Medical Unit, where public health service officers set up an ability to treat health workers. Um, all of those things were incredibly valuable. But I think uh, one of the big takeaways for, for me, and I think it's probably true for many of the people on the Ebola Task Force, is that we have to be prepared next time. And, and what we're going to get hit with next is not going to be Ebola. And it might be in a place where the U.S. military isn't able or not welcome uh, to come and help. Um, or it might be in a place where the three countries affected or the number of countries affected don't work so well together. We were incredibly lucky that those three countries worked very well together in the crisis and none of them collapsed. Um, if that had happened, it would have been an entirely different uh, kind of situation with even more um, risks associated with it. And so I think most of us came away from from that crisis feeling um, sad, um, heartened by the, the good in people and the incredible resilience in countries like Sierra Leone, Guinea and Liberia, but also with the, the ability that we just can't let that ever happen again. Mm. The, the big problem that you were facing was that you didn't know how many cases there were and where quickly enough. So you were flying blind a lot of the time. And, and is, is that just symptomatic of the, the relatively poor health infrastructure in those countries? So I think it, it's partially symptomatic of the poor health in infrastructure, but I think um, that it's it's um, it's part of the the fact that we don't really have um, national or global biosurveillance systems, and that's that's kind of a, a jargony term. But the ability to actually get from case data um, to anal analyzed um, information um, in situations where people are are actually migratory that that's a problem that's very common to a number of countries in the world. And then the fact that these three countries had had never dealt with Ebola and and there was a, a huge uh, barrier to overcome just in convincing 
um, uh, some some people in the population that it was that it was real, and and that's a communication challenge and a, and a data challenge. So, yes, in some total, that was that was one of the major problems, just having uh, good data, but also having uh, really good ways to tran- transmit that data and to analyze it and to work as a global community in a crisis on um, on uh, anything that you need to work on on the response, on the research that needed to happen during the crisis, on the medical care, on who should be where, on how many Ebola treatment units data became absolutely the key to, to everything. Hmm. I remember there was a time when it was quite unclear whether we were actually going to be able to, to put out the, the fire uh, of Ebola in those countries. Uh, and it was an open possibility that it might spread quite, quite widely, uh, at least ac- across countries that didn't have sufficiently good uh, containment mechanisms. And then Ebola uh, seemed, to, seemed to go away. There was a big international response. Uh, and uh, basically, we did, we did manage to win. My understanding is that the thing that made the biggest difference wasn't even necessarily the international uh, response. Um, the, the U.S. military, from what I've heard, uh, arrived in, in large numbers, but but a bit too late. Uh, the, the, the pandemic was already receding by then. And the thing that made the biggest difference was a uh, change in burial methods in those countries, because uh, traditional burial practices uh, in West Africa involve uh, the family members bathing and kissing the, the, the bodies of their relatives, uh, which is an, an incredibly good way of spreading uh, of spreading Ebola. Uh, and uh, local rural communities uh, eventually seeing the devastation that they were facing uh, apparently changed their burial practices and, and that uh, really managed to slow down the spread. Is, is, have I got the story right there? So that's, that was definitely a big factor. And that was uh, certainly something that our USAID um, supported by working with the communities on safe burial practices. It was a big focus of the U.S. Uh, part of the Ebola response. So a- absolutely, that was a huge, um, that was recognized as a big challenge and something that was that was a a, a really um, big focus for the international um, response community that was working with those the three affected countries but what I what I guess one of the things I would say is I, I certainly um, I don't refute the the data about the course of the outbreak but what I will say is that it's very hard to know what would have happened in the absence of the response and the response at all different periods so I think it's absolutely true that an earlier response would have been better. But I don't um, necessarily ascribe to the notion that the response that did happen in September um, didn't make the di- the main difference in the outbreak or even a, a large difference. And I, and I don't think that's exactly what you said, but I think it's really important to, to recognize what it meant, what it potentially meant, what it did mean to the to the people in the country that saw the response there, that saw clean places for people to come and be treated, that were receiving risk messages on a regular basis, that that felt like people showed up and were there and that there was leadership. Um, and and I, I don't at all uh, believe that the outbreak would have ended when it did if it wasn't for the, the response um, that the U.S. put forward and that other countries um, put forward. I think that it is, though, really important to better understand each of the different types of elements of the response. And so, you know, the the importance of safe burial, the importance of communication messages in different communities and how they work. So anthropology became a huge um, piece of, of the outbreak. Um, and including anthropologists on teams uh, working in the field, um, absolutely vital to the to the response. And then being able to, um, you know, have an effective emergency operations center in every country in the world that can that can respond um, to an outbreak and centralize government um, agencies' ability to respond um, cogently and to get information in one centralized location. Those kinds of things um, are absolutely vital coming out. And I think scratching down, digging down into into what all of those elements are is something that that's vital. That that said, um, showing up and leading is always going to be important. And so I I don't think that um. I don't think that our response was in any way um, not effectual. Hmm. I've read a bunch of articles about that outbreak by uh, Laurie Garrett, who I mentioned you're, you're, you're very familiar with. And they're, they're exciting stories and, and, and tragic stories and really uh, heartbreaking in a way because in, in a lot of the, of the cities there, um, the, the health infrastructure is, is very poor. And um, what doctors and, and nurses there are often did, don't, don't have even uh, you know, soap necessarily or, or gloves to, to avoid uh, getting, uh, getting infections themselves. And I, I read about um, the, the people in the Ministry of Health and, and, and the, the, the frontline uh, medical staff who uh, were dying in, in really quite significant numbers and, and were working on absolutely no sleep. They were completely overwhelmed by the, by the scale of the number of people coming into the hospitals at the, at the peak of the epidemic. Uh, and many of them weren't even, in fact, being paid because there was uh, no money. They'd, they'd run out of money. Uh, in uh, at least one of the one of the countries, but despite that, uh, most of them uh, continued to go into work, uh, facing really a, a very high personal uh, risk risk of death uh, in order to uh, in order to prevent the spread of the epidemic, uh, epidemic and just uh, 
my heart went out to them. It was uh, like like going to the beaches uh, on, on D-Day, really. They were uh, taking an enormous personal risk in order to, to protect all of us from, from the spread of a, of a really, really horrible disease. No, that's absolutely true. Um, it, the, the personal, um, the personal tragedy that came out of Ebola for, for health workers, for people who went back again and again and lost huge numbers of their own community was, was just, um, it was just heartbreaking. And I think the other thing, um, that, is certainly uh, talked about, but maybe um, always bears repeating, is just the incredible stigma that survivors of Ebola faced. And some of the survivors of Ebola went went back um, to continue to work because they had already survived and were immune. And so, um, but were facing stigma from their own communities. And, and, um, and that happened, the stigma actually happened even here in the United States with mm. Ebola survivors. Um, and some of the most poignant meetings that I had coming out of the Ebola epidemic were with um recovered um, uh, with survivors from, from Ebola. And so what one um, example, you know, uh, several months after the Ebola epidemic ended, you know, we had an opportunity to meet with survivors from Sierra Leone and the community that they had formed for um, Ebola survivors. And it's, it's just an incredible continuing journey um, for, for them to work with the communities and to, to actually continue even, even then to, and, and now to educate um, about, about Ebola and the continued research um for and with the, that survivor community about the long-term impacts of Ebola um, is also um, is also something that that was not um, w- was not easy and not anticipated, but but hopefully we'll be learning a lot more about the long-term impacts of this disease. Yeah, it sounds like it's a bit of scientific illiteracy that's driving that, which might be more more easy to sympathize with in Liberia than in the than in the U.S., where people should really know better. Yeah, I think stigma is a terrible thing wherever it occurs, and the the root the root um, cause is always lack of education, and so um, that is that is a critically important thing, even in the middle of an outbreak, um, to deal with. But certainly, um, certainly uh, after the fact, um, becomes even more important in some ways. Mm. So, given your experience, are there other reforms, either at the international level or the domestic level, that that you'd like to see to, to tackle a situation that's similar to Ebola or, or potentially worse in the future? Yeah, I I I mean at the at the risk of repeating a couple of things I said, I, I will, because I think it's <laughs> worth emphasizing them again. Um, it, it, we we need an, an absolutely effective WHO emergency, a uh, health emergencies department that is able to show leadership in, in a crisis. Um, but we also need mechanisms uh, for the, the, the world to come together during an outbreak with working with WHO and with the broader UN that are effective. So again, back to exercising as a world to be able to poke holes in the things that didn't work in Ebola and, that, and even in the areas where we, where we provided reforms and think we've got it right, just to make sure, very helpful. Um, we need more funding for medical countermeasures around the world to get to a point where we have platforms that can be used for any type of disease threat that might come our way, naturally occurring, modified, new, created. Um, we're not where we need to be on that. And CEPI is a really good start, um, but we need to do more on that front. Public health emergency financing, um, so having an emergency response fund, um, critically important. Um, we, we as a U.S. government need to be prepared for anything that happens, and we need to have um, reliable funding in place um, for um, for our own healthcare system to be able to to handle a crisis. In addition to being able to help others, and to that end, um, it's it's disappointing that the the president's proposal um, puts forward um, some proposed cuts in a number of different budgets associated with with pandemic preparedness and biosecurity. And so, I think um, I think making sure uh, that we have a really uh, good sense of, of what the need actually is and um, a really good strategy in place for, for financing those needs is important. And then finally, the global ability to stop outbreaks at the source. So every country knowing where it stands in terms of preparedness, measuring that, and then filling the gaps and having um, catalytic financing for countries to be able to, to, um, to, uh, so uh, I think one of the, one of the major things that would be incredibly helpful in the, in this space would be to have um, a fund that would allow countries that want to put more money into pandemic preparedness to be able to draw upon it and as leverage to get some additional funding in their own budgets to improve pandemic preparedness, and then to be able to measure over time that they've actually been able to fill the gaps um, as a way to leverage and increase their own financing from their host ministries. I think there's a tremendous number of organizations that are interested in putting funding forward for pandemic preparedness, but people are not quite sure where to put that money, where it's going to be measured. Um, it's easier to see an effect for a specific drug or a vaccine or a treatment, number of people treated, number of people vaccinated. 
for health security, there's a large number of indicators, and it's a little bit harder to see how a little bit of, uh, of, of funding makes a difference. And so having a, a constructive way to do that that's organized, I think, is really important. Mm. Yeah, this week, uh, the Republicans in Congress or in the Senate were, were debating health care reform. And uh, one, of the, one of the suggestions that they put up for health care reform involved a one-seventh cut to the Centers for Disease Control uh, budget. When I saw that, I was just uh, uh, upset. Uh, it's really uh, the opposite of the direction that I think we need to be going. That The Centers for Disease Control, as far as I can tell, uh, are just an absolute uh, bunch of heroes who are protecting the entire planet from, from one of the biggest, uh, biggest threats that we face. And that, I don't think they get enough recognition, um, either from Americans or indeed people around the world, for, for the work that they're doing. Here, here. I couldn't, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think thinking about um, the Centers for Disease Control as part of our biodefense, when someone from the CDC helps a country stop an outbreak at the source by helping them detect it, by training field epidemiologists, by um, developing an emergency operations center, that is biodefense. That is stopping an outbreak at the source. And we, we're in a position right now where the Ebola supplemental funding provided um, a great bolus of funding for health security. And the, the Congress should be absolutely recognized for deciding to put us to, to provide a specific piece of the Ebola supplemental for forward thinking global health security. But that funding ends in 2019, and a number of the CDC experts around the world um, are being funded with that with that bolus. And so, if the if the budget for CDC is chopped, and if it doesn't get increased um, past 2019, many of those people will start coming home. I would predict next year um, at the latest, because they'll have to make plans for where they're going to go next and what they'll do with their families. And I think that will be a tremendous disservice to our national and global um, health security and biodefense, because we won't we'll have a, a large um, decrease in the number of CDC experts around the world who are able to help stop outbreaks at the source. Mm. Yeah, in, increasing funding for the for the military and security services while while cutting cutting funding for the Centers for Disease Control uh, strikes me as uh, as just just a bizarre set of priorities or understandings of how the world works. But uh, speaking of funding, I understand that uh, over the last few years there's been attempts to get uh, funding from Congress to help control the the Zika virus, which has been spreading through South and Central America and then into the into the United States. But that uh, funding hasn't really been uh, been forthcoming, uh, and which, which I guess is a is a bad sign for how long it might take to get uh, funding to control any other pandemics in future. Do, do you know much about that situation? Yeah, so I was I was in many of those conversations, and I think the main thing that I would say about it is that we can't afford to politicize our pandemic preparedness. And you know, it, it while we had um, a really uh, strong set of conversations um, that went into the Ebola supplemental um, that was received uh, in, in the middle of that crisis. The Zika response, I think, conflated several several things in the discussions um, that were had. And, and one of those things was that we, we can only afford to be prepared for one thing at a time, which is absolutely not true. We, we have to be able to deal with more than one crisis at a time. And this gets back to having um, a couple of things. One, that we shouldn't be in a position of pitting um, needs uh, with Zika, which were absolutely vital, um, against um, the ongoing need uh, for global health security and Ebola response and recovery in West Africa. But two, um, that we shouldn't be thinking about these things uh, as emergency supplementals to be to begin with. When, when you're in the middle of a crisis and you have to ask for money, you're in, already too late. Uh, you need to have uh, the ability to fund the work that you need to develop countermeasures, to improve detection capability, to create better diagnostics for new diseases that we didn't know much or anything about, like Zika. We need to have that available um, to us um, in the government uh, without having to ask for, for big boluses of supplemental funding in each case. It's just not practical. Uh, you mentioned that Angela Merkel deserves some credit for helping to do uh, pandemic simulations with the G20. Are there any other countries that really stand out as contributing to increasing pandemic preparedness and, and deserve a shout out for their work? Yeah, well, I'd be uh, pretty remiss if I didn't um, give President Barack Obama some serious credit here. Um, the U.S. government... Um, put forward as part of the global health security agenda, we put on the table that we would assist at least uh, 31 countries and the Caribbean community. And we put an extra billion dollars into IHR preparedness around the world. So our ability to help countries um, implement the international health regulations. And and we, we did that with metrics and milestones. All of those countries um, were asked to develop their own national plan with the specific metrics that had been developed by, um, by countries through the global health security agenda and then adopted by the WHO. So that was an enormous contribution. Um, but I should also say that the countries that decided to be partners in that effort also deserve a tremendous amount of credit. They agreed uh, to be part of an entirely new way 
of looking at pandemic preparedness, where there would be a national plan with metrics over the course of five years, um, where there would be um, specific transparent discussions about gaps, which are often um, scary when it comes to pandemic preparedness. And, um, you know, most of those countries, many of those countries, we're countries in Africa, and we saw um, a lot of, of interest during the U.S.-Africa uh, Leaders Summit that President Obama put put in place um, in 2014, and that um, that effort um, really led to um, an interest in developing an Africa CDC, uh, which is now up and running um, out of the African Union in Addis Ababa. We saw um, the WHO uh, Regional Organization for Africa taking some leadership roles um, after uh, Ebola. And so I want to give the countries themselves um, some great credit and also the countries that have undergone external evaluations and published them. That's something that absolutely needs to be applauded and, and needs to be um, encouraged, because um, if every country in the world uh, does that, we'll be in a much uh, better place because we'll, we'll know as a world where the gaps are and we'll be much more uh, better place to address them. But I, I should also give um, some some credit to um, the Japanese government, which had the G7 summit in 2016, um, and um, and made a a, a really uh, great uh, leadership effort, um, which led to the G7 leaders agreeing to assist 76 countries and regions um, to um, address pandemic threats. And so that's a huge commitment that's out there, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing that commitment tracked and realized um, with countries around the world over the next several years. And this is just a small number of countries. There's an enormous number of countries prioritizing this issue. But I think understanding how all of those different commitments come together um, and how they're tracked and measured, um, that's a place where, we, where the community still has some work to do. Hmm. Globally, do we have a, a decent capacity to produce new vaccines and medicines for new, new diseases as they emerge? Or should, should we be scaling that up and uh, increasing the flexibility of the uh, research and, and manufacturing capabilities? Yeah, so we should be scaling that up. Um, I mentioned the Coalition for Epidemics Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, which was um, one uh, really um, tremendous new effort, which uh, was uh, conceived of during the World Economic, um, conceived of and discussed during the World Economic Forum in 2016, and then formally launched this year. Um, at the World Economic Forum in 2017. And so that effort is relatively new, um, but I think has a lot of promise. And its its goal is to be able to do just that, to be able to scale up um, development of vaccines and countermeasures um, and to to um, equitably and rapidly distribute them, because that's another huge barrier with, with medical countermeasures is the ability to develop them, test them, and then get them where they need to go um, in a rapid period of time. But for, for the extraordinary um, innovation that CEPI is, and I don't in any way want to um, want to demonize, demonize that tremendous effort, um, much more needs to be done um, on that. And so I look forward to seeing the next steps for CEPI. And then I also look forward to seeing um, other, other countries around the world and the U.S. continue to invest more um, in this area because we, we're definitely not where we need to be. How can that kind of thing be, be funded? I imagine that most vaccines are produced by, by pharma companies, right? Uh, and a lot of the research capacity, I guess, would be in universities and, and pharmaceutical uh, companies. But they're, they're going to have the capacity that is pro kind of profit maximizing, at least at least for the companies. But we kind of want to subsidize them so that they have more researchers and more manufacturing capacity so that uh, we can respond if, if, if there's a disaster scenario. Uh, do we, can we pay them extra for producing vaccines or pay them for like having slack capacity? Yeah, I think um, you know, I, th I think that the the U.S. Um, uh, effort through BARDA is one of the is one of the innovative ways to do this, and CEPI really takes um, takes a, a bit of the model um, from BARDA, which is to develop a you know a, a partnership with companies. I think you know the, one of the things that I hear frequently from companies um, in in various panel discussions about this topic that I've attended over the past couple of months is just the need um, to have really specific planning with those companies and then to be able to um, to follow through on that planning. And if um, if there's a decision made to ask a company um, or to partner with a company to create a new countermeasure um, to then follow through, because the, the thing that, that really makes it difficult and makes companies want to leave the area of developing medical countermeasures for pandemic threats is when they don't think um, that when there's instability in the market, when they don't know um, that they'll actually have a, a purchaser at the end of the day. So is there anything you'd particularly recommend that people watch or, or read to, to learn more about how you know, international and, and domestic uh, pandemic response can be improved? Getting back to one of the themes we talked about earlier, which is um, the, the the fact that even if we identify all of the gaps, financing as a world, how countries can actually um, responsibly and quickly fill those gaps is a, is a big hole. Um, there is one recent report that came out in May that I would highly recommend. It's a, it's a really good read, and the recommendations are very crisp. And it's um, from a group called the International Working Group on Pandemic Preparedness Financing, and it's called From Panic 
um, to neglect. And um, that report is available on the World Bank's uh, website, and I would, I would highly recommend that one. Mm. So, so far, we've mostly been talking at a, at a pretty high level about uh, what we would like to, to see changed internationally. And I want to now try to zoom in a little bit more on what the people listening can, can potentially uh, do themselves. Um, but first, what, what people working in pandemic preparedness are, are you most uh, impressed by and, and would, would maybe like to see more people join? Yeah, I'm I'm particularly impressed um, in terms of groups that are looking especially at links between health and security, and then also um, groups that are looking at um, biosecurity and advances in technology. Um, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security is um, headed up by Dr. Tom Inglesby. That group is doing uh, phenomenal work, and um, I think that they're regularly publishing um, innovative and interesting uh, reports and, and ideas, as well as convening dialogues around the world. Um, so I would highly, highly recommend looking at, at their site, and um, and I'd love to see more work in those areas. Um, also, iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, um, they have been they have pioneered um, some some great work not only in working with students on innovations, but also looking at safety and security. And Piers Millet is the um, is the lead for safety at at, at iGEM, and and they're doing uh, great work. And I think they could build on that work um, to do more with the next generation in terms of risk management. I'm also uh, really impressed uh, with the SynBio Leap program out at Stanford um, and the work that Megan Palmer and Dave, Dave Rahman have done um, in, in building the community, but also uh, building in uh, respons responsible um, science at the same time. So that's just a, a snapshot um, of groups. And I think um, that we've been uh, really fortunate to have um, a new funder in the Open Philanthropy Project. And I know that you spoke with Hallie a little bit about their work, but I just want to stress that there really aren't very many organizations that are funding biosecurity and pandemic preparedness as a niche area. And um, and I think that that um, that has um, that has held back uh, progress, certainly in the civil society space um, globally. So just looking beyond um, beyond some of the, the groups that are that, that I mentioned in civil society, the, the global health security agenda, which is now 59 countries and the JEE alliance, which is looking at how countries can uh, understand their own preparedness gaps and fill them. Those organizations are doing great work. And I think that all countries should consider joining. Mm. Are there any technologies you'd like to see developed that uh, you think would, would improve pandemic preparedness? Specific technologies? Yeah, specific technologies, uh, like, you know, the ability to, to detect uh, um, diseases uh, more quickly. I know there's, there's some attempts to, you know, make it easier to sequence, uh, say, the, you know, all of the, all of the pathogens that are, that are inside a person when they're admitted to hospital. Yeah, I think from from my perspective, the some of the innovations that I think I, I would like to see, I'd like to see innovations that look at the security side of the equation. So asking uh, really creative and tough questions like, what if the next generation of DNA synthesizers just wouldn't make smallpox? Is that possible? Can we think about that? Um, and and how, how would that kind of innovation be incentivized and funded? Um, I'd really like to see that. I'd also like to see um, less on the side of technology and more on the side of who's actually creating that technology. I'd like to see um, a global biosecurity core. Um, we have a great program called Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity um, that is currently funded by Open Philanthropy and, um, and overseen out of the Hopkins Center for Health Security. Making that global and linking it with other next generation efforts that are out there in different parts of the world and through the global health security agenda, that would be enormously useful. And then detection technology. So looking at, to get back to that question that you asked earlier about what we talked about earlier about data and the inability to get good data during the Ebola outbreak, the ability to have pandemic prediction capability so that we could predict pandemics and we pr could predict emerging uh, disease threats the way that we predict the weather, that would be pretty cool. Um, people are talking about it, but we really don't have that kind of capability or that technology. Mm. You mentioned that uh, it's a pretty niche area and that there's not necessarily that, that much money in it. Uh, at 80,000 hours, sometimes we, we talk about uh, different areas being uh, talent, uh, talent, having talent gaps versus funding gaps. So sometimes you can have lots of really talented people who'd like to work on a problem, but they've, they've got no money available to them to actually do it. And sometimes you have the, the other situation where there's lots of funders, but there's no one who actually has the, the necessary skills to, uh, to, to tackle the problem. So no one who can make use of the money. Uh, would, you, would you say uh, biosecurity is, is more one or the other? And is, is this also a, a good thing for, for donors to potentially moving into as, as well as people who want to you know, actually use their career? I think it's both actually in this case, but I also think that um, that we do have a dearth of people who've been trained in in biosecurity writ large. And I think some of the programs I mentioned before, um, like the LB program, um, like SynBioLeap and others, are and iGEM are looking uh, to change that equation. Uh, but I think that there's there's just not nearly enough, given how fast the technology is moving and how many people are are working on it. Um, we just don't we have a, a, a mismatch in um, in the number of people who are focused on the on the biosecurity specific piece. And it may be that we need um, some specific additional people that are just focused in biosecurity, but it probably is is more of a situation where we need 
people who are trained in the science and looking at technology and, and policy um, who also have biosecurity as one of the things that they focus on. Um, so it's adding it in to existing disciplines, and then it's also building the discipline out itself, and then it's also um, funding uh, for all, all, all three of those things. Yeah. I know that uh, some some parts of the intelligence services in the military are interested in uh, in biological threats, and they they sometimes have a lot of money to throw around. Uh, do, do, do they dominate the space, or, or do they dominate it? But it's it's all classified, and so it's kind of quite separate from what people are working on outside of those areas. So I can't comment on on anything in the in the classified space. But what I can say is um is certainly there's um there's a, a lot of funding for innovative uh, new technologies, including in biosecurity in places like DARPA, for example. Um, you know, one example is their Safe Genes project that looks at how you might inhibit gene editing. You know, if if gene editing were ever to go awry, could you actually in, inhibit it um, in some way? Um, and DARPA over the years has has certainly uh, funded great innovations. And I think um, that that while it's great that we have the funding coming through those programs, um, we also uh, definitely need um, additional funding sources and funding sources in civil society. Mm. From an advocacy point of view, uh, who whose minds needs to be need, need to be changed in order to to get better policies in the U.S. and, and internationally? Is it is it bureaucrats who aren't uh, convinced that this is such a problem or they don't know what to do about it, or is it uh, politicians or, or, or journalists? Uh, if, if you were writing an, an op-ed about this topic, who who are you who are you whose mind are you trying to change? Yeah, I think. Um, I think that it's probably three communities uh, for different reasons. It's the government. It's um, academics and the academic elite uh, communities, and then it's also uh, philanthropists. And I think all three of those communities recognize that pandemic preparedness and biosecurity are important. I think, though, that there's been um, a lot more focus on response, which is absolutely important, and developing new drugs and vaccines is vital. But I think there's been less focus on the upstream pieces uh, since we're, we aren't at a place where we have the medical countermeasure for everything, as we discussed before. Um, we really should be focusing on preventing um, outbreaks from becoming epidemics in the first place. And that means biosecurity, detection technology, investments in public health workforce. Um, and I think um, that even among those areas, um, it's not that that people don't care. It's that people don't prioritize it above other threats. And so I, if I were writing an op-ed, I'd be aiming at all three of those communities, but really breaking down the problem and saying, here's why you should care now. Here's why this rises to a level um, where it, it should be at the top of the agenda. <laughs> is, is there any potential for someone to organize a kind of grassroots campaign of people saying, you know, I, I don't want to die in a flu pandemic. So please, government, do do something more to protect me. Yeah, so I think that I I think I think advocacy is um is a missing component for pandemic preparedness. Many years ago, I worked at the American Cancer Society, and I work with people in communities that focus on many different disease threats. And it's easy to easier to rally a campaign around a specific group of people who've been affected by something very specific. It's a lot harder to get people motivated amongst all of their core priorities that they have to look at any pandemic that might arise from any situation. And so um, it's just very challenging to get people to focus on it. I'd say two things. One, by focusing on on pandemic preparedness and the core health security um, needs that countries have, you're helping with every disease threat, including some chronic diseases that people face. Um, and second, if you don't, um, if you if you don't spend time uh, focusing on this, you're going to pay an enormous amount at the at the back end. Um, preparedness costs a lot less than response, um, and uh, and we we really need to be be prepared early. But I think there's a a, a much um, I do think there's a lot of room for advocacy around this issue, and we haven't seen the kind of grassroots uh, campaign focused on this that we have on specific disease threats. Mm. I think it's it's one of the reasons that we uh, prioritize uh, pandemic preparedness is that we we think it's pretty neglected relative to to the scale of the problem, uh, and I imagine a lot of the reason is just that it's a lot easier to rally people around problems that already exist and are very clear uh, than it is to, to rally them around a problem that, that doesn't yet, yet exist but but might. Um, and in fact, pe people sometimes you know make make fun of you. Some sometimes people have made fun of us because uh, a lot of our recommended problems are uh, things that we think risks that we think will exist in the future that don't exist now, where we think you can get a lot, of, a lot of leverage by helping to to prepare us while very few people are, are working on them. Uh, but you can sometimes seem uh, a bit disconnected from the real world, where there's uh, you know people are dying of uh, things right now. Um, so I, I'd, lo I'd love to see a grassroots campaign. I, I worry that uh, the odds might be against you trying to get enough people concerned about uh, something that isn't already in people's faces. It's, it's so hard to get attention around uh, political issues. Uh, as it is. So I think it comes down to making it real for people, uh, what it is that they're getting from pandemic preparedness. And then again, what it is, how it is that they're going to actually measure success. Because I think um, with anything where you're focusing on prevention, measuring success is much more challenging because you can't yeah. measure that something didn't happen. You have to measure other things. 
Fortunately, in this space, there's lots of things that can be measured and we now have metrics. It's just um, making it real for people that are putting uh, putting dollars and advocacy um, into this problem. And I, I think that absolutely can be done. Um, we just need to spend a little bit more con- of a concerted effort um, figuring out what works in different communities and how to do it. Mm. Yeah, we have had uh, some some pandemics or some new diseases in our in our lifetime, but I, I guess we just haven't had a had a really big one. We haven't had a huge one since uh, nineteen eighteen. So maybe people are a little bit complacent if uh, recent experience hasn't hasn't alarmed us maybe as much as it as it should. I think that's true, but I also I also think that that um that people for, forget the fear and panic associated with Ebola. I mean, it, mm. you know, we almost closed the borders. We yeah. almost closed the borders to the United States of America because of Ebola, and it was nowhere near um, what we would see with a with an airborne disease of high lethality. So, mm. I I think um, I think it is making it clear to people what what would happen and um, and how it is that we're getting huge benefits from the dollars that we're actually investing in pandemic preparedness for everyday things that they can actually wrap their heads around. There's also HIV, of course, which uh, doesn't attract the same panic because it uh, is a fairly slow rolling pandemic, but it's it's still going and it's killed, I imagine, tens of millions of people now. Yeah, and we finally have an AIDS regeneration in sight. And so could, the other um, the other thing that we have a historical challenge, I guess, as, as a world, not just as a country, is that once something becomes, um, once we start making progress, people sort of uh, chalk it up to, okay, we can move on to the next one, but you have to finish the job. So um, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll, we'll keep that funding up and I'll, I'll, many of the... Um, uh, the investments in in global health security um, really dovetail with some of the investments that have been made in, in HIV, especially in building laboratory capacity, in building workforce and epidemiology training. Um, and I think making those links more clear um, that these programs are actually talking to one another and that we're leveraging the dollars effectively. I think that kind of case, particularly for a congressional audience, is really important. Mm. Getting even more more concrete now, if people want to enter this field, uh, what should listeners uh, study early on? What, what are the range of options that you're most enthusiastic about? Yeah, so um, I'm I'm really excited that you asked that question, and I hope that uh, many of our listeners are thinking about this field because it's a field where we need you, um, and we need you no matter what your your area of interest is um, in this space, whether it's building new technologies, whether it's biosecurity, whether it's pandemic preparedness and global development, or whether you want to go into political science and look at um, how um, how health and and uh, economics and instability relate. All of those things are are viable ways to enter this field. Um, this field, this health security pandemic preparedness field, um, is necessarily a field of of multi disciplines, and so it absolutely um, is a field where, if you're interested in in studying it, you sh- you should be considering um, uh, global health. You should be also considering political science, um, and you could you could start um, being interested in this field and actually getting a job in this field coming from either of those avenues um, in addition to others. So maybe just um, by way of a very very quickly uh, telling you how I got into this field, it may um, may give people solace because it wasn't uh, it wasn't particularly uh, well designed, but it, it may elucidate a number of different avenues um, to to get into the field. Um, I'm a biologist by training. And I actually didn't study infectious disease at all. I studied cancer and cancer genetics. And when I left the laboratory, I, I had this idea that I wanted to make a difference in public policy. And certainly I wanted to learn how public policy was made. So I took a, a AAAS, American Association for Advancement of Science Policy Fellowship, to work in Washington for a year. And I came, um, I came to Washington and worked on Capitol Hill in Senator Kennedy's health office. And there I got a really, really good taste of how Congress works, how legislation works, um, how um, how uh, how bills become laws. Um, back to my schoolhouse rock experience, actually <laughs> seeing that in real time, a bill on Capitol Hill. Um, and I met a, a tremendous number of people who convinced me that evidence does actually go into legislation contrary to popular belief. Certainly good legislation is informed by by policy data and evidence. Um, and then I, I went to work in a nonprofit, um, the American Cancer Society, looking at um, at public health, but from uh, the perspective of chronic disease. But in that job, I learned a lot about advocacy. I learned how to work with states and locals and to build grassroots grassroots campaigns um, to to influence um, government. And that was incredibly um, helpful for me, not just because it was really rewarding to do that specific work, but it was something that it really stuck with me and that I used later in my career. Um, and then uh, I wanted to work in global health, and I went to to get another fellowship um, to go work in the State Department uh, for a year. And I ended up working in an office that redirects former Soviet weapons scientists um, that had um, uh, weapons-related expertise to work on peaceful research projects. 
And in that job, I, I got a really, really good taste of how the health and the security communities could work together on something uh, really peaceful and helpful to mankind. And from that experience, um, for the last 13 years, I've been building uh, my expertise in what, what we call cooperative threat reduction, which is how do you work cooperatively with another country and with its experts um, to reduce threats posed by nuclear, chemical, biological uh, weapons? Um, and so that, that really translated um, coming back um, to my interest in health, global health and domestic health, um, when I got to the White House in, in looking at how cooperative threat reduction, public health, biological security and pandemic preparedness all come together. And so um, all of those different uh, jobs that I had are, are, are jobs that could be entered with a number of different uh, backgrounds. You could come into them a number of different ways. And so I just say that um, by way of uh, hopefully convincing uh, your your listeners that you can you can get there through a number of different routes um, if this is a place you're interested. But I would um, I would recommend uh, starting by reading literature that's not just focused on the public health aspects, the political instability aspects, or the biosecurity aspects. I'd read literature that looks either places um, like those uh, resources I mentioned earlier that look at the blend of those things or reading literature from all three and thinking about where the seams are and where there's still more more work to be done and studied. Mm. Is it difficult to operate at the intersection of, of different fields? It, it both seems very valuable, but also you, you can potentially end up in a situation where no one particularly thinks it's their responsibility to fund you. Yeah, I think it is challenging. I think more and more um, interdisciplinary work is becoming the is becoming the norm. Um, but I do think that it's hard to describe um, describe to a potential funder exactly what your interest area is. Fortunately, I think health security is a place where the the term one of the the things that uh, was effective before, during, and after Ebola was just frankly branding uh, this field as global health security, uh, making it clear that what we're talking about is being prepared for a biological threat, whether it's naturally occurring, accidentally caused, or deliberately released. And, and making that clear in every conversation really uh, became a brand, um, which I think now will make it easier to explain uh, what that field is and what the interdisciplinary components are. But um, yes, I think, I think it does make it more challenging, but, but then it's incumbent on, on you, uh, the listener, to explain uh, why the seam is so important and why you need to be working there. Mm. Ebola made pandemic preparedness cool again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think global the term global health security was coming into use before Ebola, but um, there was trepidation using that term, and mm. um, unfortunately for the world, it took it took an epidemic of of that proportion to to bring global health security into the mainstream. Um, so, so, how do you feel about uh, doing a medical degree? That that's one of the most common things that people are working on when they start taking an interest in this field. Yeah, I think certainly a medical degree is a really viable way um, to get engaged in, in health health security. And certainly if you're interested in treating patients, um, it's a requirement. And if you're interested in developing medical countermeasures and vaccines, um, a really good basis in immunology is, is absolutely helpful. But I'd say that it's not required. Mm. Uh, what about on the social science side? It sounded like anthropology or you know ability to, to get people to, to change their, their health behaviors could, could be really valuable. Do you, do you know people who come through that route? Yeah, so I think during Ebola, um, the role that anthropologists have to play um, was something that um, certainly um, impressed uh, a lot of people in, in the world. And it was a topic of discussion in a, a number of, of meetings that I attended during, the, during and after the Ebola epidemic. I think um, for me, not having a background in that field, watching the importance of understanding communities, how communities work together, different types of communities, even between the different Ebola-affected countries. There were a lot of differences um, in, in how communities uh, developed and are led, uh, tribal communities versus um, urban communities. Understanding uh, how your recommended interventions might work in a specific community is, is vital. And so I would definitely encourage uh, people interested in social science to look at this field because I think there are a number of important and interesting problems um, that you can solve for us. What are some smart early career steps that uh, people in their 20s uh, should make in terms of, you know, where they study or what they study, uh, you know, how they can build a network in, in this field and, and how they can learn uh, relevant skills? Are, are there conferences they should be going to or like any, any particular roles that are, that are a very good stepping stone? Yeah, I think one one uh, a couple of concrete recommendations I'd make is um, one. There are some conferences that are that are put in place to bring together um, the different communities in health and security. One example is the American Society of Microbiology's Biodefense Conference. That's a good melting pot for members of the different communities. So I would I would definitely recommend checking checking that one out. Um, 
I also um, would recommend uh, networking whatever field or route you're in of the different routes that we've discussed. I'd recommend uh, making it your business to meet and talk to people who are in other disciplines but are also interested in health security. Um, I could certainly uh, would recommend, um, if you're interested in biosecurity, applying for the LB Fellowship, the Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity Initiative Program that the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security oversees. That's a really great uh, network um, that is being built um, uh, currently largely in the U.S., but hopefully increasingly globally. And that's a, um, a place to meet uh, people who are working in this area, and they have an alumni program as well. And then finally, the Next Gen GHS Network. Um, if you Google that, Next Gen GHS Network, um, you'll find a group that has been created around um, the aspects of the global health security agenda. And that group is free to join and is global and um, is, um, is run by a leadership that's actually elected on a yearly basis by the group. And it provides uh, webinar opportunities, mentoring opportunities to get paired with an expert in health security. And I think that's another really good entry point. Hmm. Which governments or agencies are, are the best places to work? I think there's a number of different government agencies. So um, it's hard it's hard to pick uh, between a different government agency. But if you're interested in it, it kind of they're depends. All, they're all your favorites. They're all my favorites. Um, I would say that it really it depends on the type of experience you'd like to have. And um Ultimately, it's it's interesting and useful, in my view, to get experience in more than one government agency if you're interested in working um, in public service. But I'll just um, mention a couple and the different types of work that they're they're engaged in, like how it feels and what you would do. If you're interested in in working around the world and getting a firsthand experience of what kinds of health threats on a day to day basis countries are dealing with, um, I would certainly recommend uh, looking at um, the Centers for Disease Control, their Center for Global Health, and also the U.S. Agency for International Development. Um, in particular, their Bureau for, for Global Health, but also um, other pieces of USAID that give you a broader flavor of what development really means, um, what sustainable development really means. I'd also um, recommend uh, looking at other agencies that um, the public health community might not traditionally look at. Um, but, for example, the Department of State, the ability to have health diplomacy, um, diplomats that are conversant in health related topics, we learned in Ebola how critical um, that is and how important our ambassadors and having ambassadors in those three countries that could really listen uh, to agencies like CDC and USAID, that was vital. And so if you're interested in joining the Foreign Service, it's certainly a place um, where we need more people who are interested in and focused on public health. And I'd certainly be remiss if I didn't mention um, the Department of Defense. So I was a Department of Defense employee while I was on loan um, to the White House and before that time. And DOD is a huge and vast um, organization, but it has a number um, of different ways that it impacts global health that, that many of, of your listeners might not be aware of. So in addition to the cooperative threat reduction work that I mentioned, there's also overseas laboratories that have been in some countries around the world for more than 50 years working hand in hand with those countries on hard disease surveillance problems. Um, they're often places um, that learn about diseases early because they have such a good working relationship with the host governments. And so um, I would definitely consider um, consider avenues like like that, um, which you, you may not be considering, but are certainly um, places where a lot of great global health security work is being done. So there's a whole lot of places you've suggested that are really good for people later in their career, or perhaps if they've started start studied a master's degree or, or a PhD. Um, but you know, some people I talk to about this, uh, they're, they're thinking this this is all well and good, but you know, I've I've just graduated graduated with an undergraduate degree, or I'm working in some kind of related area. Perhaps they're you know doing their residency, or, or they're working in medicine. But what's what's the what's the pipeline for me to get from where I am now to being you know an expert in this area who who can make contributions to pandemic preparedness? Are, are there stepping stones that people can make to to advance their career and and, and get where they want to be, like 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 you um, eventually have? Yeah, so I think I think the good news is that there are definitely stepping stones, and um, and you can get um, into this field in a number of non traditional ways. I mentioned earlier my own background, and one thing that that I didn't say is that I've been interested in global health for a long time, but didn't have training in that specific area, despite being a biologist. And so I found a way, I found many ways to get engaged with global health um, along the way as I was working um, in other uh, pieces of the field. So while I was at State Department working more on biosecurity, um, I got interested in working with CDC and built some links there that I've kept, you know, kept up through all the different phases of my career and eventually um, helped lead to some of the work that I've, I've done since then. Um, so there are good stepping stones, but I guess the less good news is there isn't really a specific pipeline, um, one place that you can go to sort of start um, a career in this field. 
And that's definitely what organizations like the Next Gen GHS Network are trying to resolve to create a community of practice around global health security. Um, I can also, one organization I haven't spoken about yet that I would recommend um, checking out is the Georgetown uh, uh, Center for Global Health Security and, and Science. And in full disclosure, um, I'm affiliated but not paid uh, by them, um, so I, I get, can give talks to, to students there. They are a group um, that is very focused on what is the science and discipline around health security and how can we build uh, more uh, more people um, who are interested in, in coming into this field and how can we train them. So I'd recommend checking them out on Georgetown's website. But I'm very hopeful that one of the things we'll see more of in the future is more stepping stones and more clear uh, ways to get engaged in this field that's obviously needed. Mm. Are there any fun things you'd like to say to people to, to encourage them to, to go forth and work on global health security? Yeah, I would just say that um, this is a, a field where there's an incredible need, um, and it, it is, it's not always for the faint of heart, but it is a place where creativity is welcomed because the people who've been successful and who are leading in this field are people who really had to be creative about how to bring together different communities. So if you're a person that's interested in pandemics, no matter how they're caused, who's interested in, in the intersection of health and security, uh, please join us. Uh, we need you. And uh, this time, uh, the time that we're in right now is one of the most exciting times uh, for global health security that I've seen throughout my career. So I'm very hopeful um, that you'll come join us. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for, for all your time and, and, and your advice. I would um, maybe also be, be good to talk to other people from the from the Nuclear Threat Initiative about uh, other areas that you're working in, like, uh, like nuclear security, which I think a lot of listeners might be interested to, to hear more about. Yeah, no, I'm really happy to um, to put you in touch with with other uh, people here who focus on nuclear materials security and also radiological cybersecurity as well. Um, it's an area that we're we're really passionate about and really happy to um, to provide you with more details and additional potential interviewees. Fantastic! Uh, all, all very exciting topics. Well, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Uh, have a great evening. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that pretty deep dive into pandemic preparedness careers. If you could see yourself taking one of those roles or perhaps doing a relevant PhD and potentially going into it uh, later in your career, then you should definitely apply for coaching from 80,000 Hours. We know a lot of people in the area, as you can probably tell, and we've thought a lot about the various different options that you could take, how much impact that would have and how much career capital you'd develop. So we have a lot of useful things to say. So do apply for coaching. There's a link to the application form in the show notes and the blog post. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week.